I'll be continuing the study of I am the good shepherd. I, I've titled this poured out his soul unto death. This is the third sharing of I am the good shepherd. We're going to jump into the book of John. We've been here for quite some time. If you followed these uh, teachings, uh, as we looked at I am the door right before we got into I am the good shepherd. And they are in the same place in John. So in John 10, verse 10, the Bible says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down or gives his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I am no, and I know my own, and my own know me. Glory to God. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my father. All right here, I want to bring your attention to a number of things in this passage of scripture. First, in verse 10 of John 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay, life here is a Greek word, zoe, zo or zoe, I'll call it zoe. And it means just that, life. But I want to bring this to your attention because Zoe is not the only word used in this passage of scripture for life. In fact, here through 10 through 18 where I read, I don't know that it's used here again. Jesus says that I have come that you may have life. This is a very distinct kind of life. And I want to emphasize that. This is not soul life. Now, the other word used for life here in John 10, 10 through 18, is the word soul. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This is, if you look up the word in a Strong's Dictionary. This is word 5590 in the Greek. Suke, which means the soul. It's the soul of man. And it's a distinction of what Jesus says in John 10. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. This is Zoe life. And then what he says, that he lays down his life, that is soul, for the sheep. Jesus laid down his soul. It's actually, we're going to read this later on, but it's actually found in Isaiah 53, where it's prophesied that he would pour out his soul unto death. And here, as the good shepherd, 
He's pouring out his soul unto death. Glory to God. And I point out these two words because it's very important to understand the words for life in your Bible. Many times the Bible uses the word soul, and that is dealing with the vitality, the life of man. And then the Bible uses the word zoe, which I believe is dealing with the life of God. And Jesus was saying, I've come that you may have the life of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of the living God. In John 10, or John 14, 10, excuse me, 14, 6, I'll get it right in a second. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that word life there, again, is zoe. Not the same word that he says. He's pouring out his life unto death, his soul unto death. He also says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. That, again, is the word zoe. And I really want to bring a distinction to this. Because Jesus became a living soul. <laughs> now you say, whoa, 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 Brother Wayne, where, where do you come with that? Well, by the scripture. In Philippians 2, turn to Philippians 2. The Bible is speaking of Jesus here, of Christ. Verse 5 of Philippians 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, now I'm going to stop you here. He was in the form of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 4, John 4, and we're turning back to Philippians, so says that God is a spirit and seeketh those to worship him and spirit and in truth. In fact, Jesus said to them, now is the time, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. So he was in the form of God. You could say he is spirit or was spirit. Back to Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, shape, nature, that's what that word means, form, of God, God is spirit, thought it not robbery to be equal of God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Now, John 1 says this, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us but follow this in philippians took upon him the form of a sermon and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore god wherefore god also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here in Philippians, like I've said, we have form of God and form of man. And I wanted to point out God's form is spirit. 
man's form is soul. So Jesus became a man. He lowered himself and took upon him the form of a servant made in the likeness of a man. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So as a man, he lowered, he lowered himself as a man. In, in verse 44 of 1 Corinthians 15, is speaking of the resurrection. And Jesus actually says, I am the resurrection, but 1 Corinthians 15 is speaking of the resurrection. It says, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. The first man, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving or quickening spirit. First man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man was made a life-giving spirit. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So what I believe I'm seeing, and the Lord can correct my heart, I've want to keep my heart completely open to the Lord. He can correct my heart. Is that he was form of God and he lowered himself into humanity and became, as a man, a soul. Because as form of God, he can never offer himself as God. So he had to lower himself as man to pour out his soul unto death. That was the offering for man, for the living soul. God breathed into man, the Bible says, and he became a living soul. Not a life-giving spirit, but a living soul having the vitality of a soul. The rationality of mind of a soul. Knowing himself. Knowing man. That's what man, in the beginning, God created man, breathed in him the breath of life. And he became a soul. Now, here in Corinthians, it says the first man is a living soul. The last man is a life-given spirit. And I know we're, we understand that's speaking of Adam and it's speaking of Christ. So Jesus came as a man in order to offer his soul unto God. And if I go into the Old Testament and look up the word soul, and again, if I can pronounce these words, it is a Hebrew word, nephesh. Nephesh, nephesh. And it is dealing with the being, a living being. So Adam was a living being. And this word nephesh, if I understand my Bible right, would be parallel to the Greek word suke for the soul, which deals with the mind, the intellect, the, the inward man. So, so you and me, our souls, who we are, our being. Now that's what I understand. I, I And there is most likely way more to it than I understand. But God breathed and man became a soul. 
become having vitality, having the ability to comprehend and understand and know of himself. But I want you to notice something, even back there in the garden, in the garden was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And Jesus comes and says, I've come that you might have life, Zoe, life, God life. So man ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He ate of his own mind, I believe. He agreed in his heart and ate with what the serpent said. He saw, Eve saw, Eve saw a tree that was good to the sight. And ate of it. And Adam took and ate of it. And they fell in death and decay. And so we know that all mankind sinned, Romans 3, and fell short of the glory of God. And Ezekiel 18, in several places in Ezekiel, actually, but I will read Ezekiel 18, for behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And you can go through that in Ezekiel 18. If one soul is righteous, it'll live. If another soul sins, it'll die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, and the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. But the soul that sins shall die. And Paul wraps this up in Romans says, but now the righteousness of God, Romans 3, the righteousness of God, Without the laws manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all sin and come short of the glory of God. All sin. Romans 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, it entered into the world upon all men through Adam and death by sin. So death passed upon all men and so death for all, for that all have sin. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So we have man in sin and death. In Romans 8, Paul says the carnal mind is enmity with God, and he calls the mind of the flesh death. So, in man, he's just trapped in death. So, what's his solution? The good shepherd gives his life, his soul, for the sheep. That's the solution. I am the good shepherd. I give my life, my soul, as an offering to God for the sheep. No man taketh my soul from me, Jesus says, my life from me, for I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. Now, I believe he may be speaking here of the eternal spirit. This is something I need to study out. I have the power to lay it down. Christ through the 
eternal spirit offered himself, I believe Hebrews says, unto God. And he has the power to take it again. He is raised by the spirit of God. So what I'm looking at here is Jesus as a man died as a soul. As the eternal spirit of God, Christ never died. Just something I'm looking at. Look at it with me. Consider it with me. But here as a man, he became a man to offer himself unto God. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Says, Who hath believed their report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, this is just coming in my mind because we have an idea of what Jesus may have looked like in the flesh. But here Isaiah says he has no form nor commonness. And there is no beauty that we would desire him and, and that he's despised and rejected of men. Verse four, surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his what way? Own way, own mind, own thoughts, own purpose. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is done. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he hadn't done no violence and neither was deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, all have sinned. Make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now Jesus poured out his soul, his person as a man, to death, gave it up, gave himself up. I know we say he gave up his body, but he gave up his being, his soul. He says in John, now is my soul troubled. John chapter eight. Now my soul is troubled. And he 
says something to the fact that could he be saved from this hour? But no, he came for this very hour, this very purpose. Father, glorify your name. And of course, there's a voice that comes that he has glorified it and he's glorified it again. But his soul was burdened because he was offering up himself to death. He that knew no sin bore the iniquity of us all. The soul that sinneth shall die. So Christ offered himself, became the sin offering, poured out his soul, his person, to death. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. To bring us into his death. To bring our souls into his death. That we could be raised in his life. And I want to make a real, real distinction here as back in the beginning. I have come that you may have life. That's not so life. Now, your soul, you have that life. But that is God life. That is Christ life. That is the life he was from the beginning. That's why he says, Father, glorify me with thine own self. With that glory that I have with you before the world was. He was in a whole different life than you and me. He was in God life. And he lowered himself as a man and found in fashion as a man a living soul. He humbled himself to die the death of the cross. And in his death, he brought us with him to death to release us from the death, from the sin that Adam had brought upon all mankind and give us his life. We have his life living in us. That's not just our souls living forever. That's what we've got in our mind. Well, I'm going to live forever. Okay. We are. We're in eternal life. But the life that we're living is his life. What we have received is his life. That's why Paul says it's not I that liveth. It's not the soul life living, but it's Christ living in me. It's the eternal spirit of God that has taken his abode in me and my soul is coming to know who he is. Glory to God. And that's why Jesus offered himself at the cross to bring us into this life. Now, turn with me to Hebrews 9, a couple more places. A couple more places. Hebrews 9 says that it is appointed unto men once to die. This is verse 27. But after this, the judgment, after the death, the judgment, after this appointment of death, the judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So Christ took the appointment of death upon himself and brought it to his death. That those that look for him, he appears in life, salvation. 
Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4, in verse 17. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind their own understanding, their own intellect. <laughs> Having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life, this is Zoe here, not the soul, the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So they're alienated through ignorance of God because of the hardness of their heart. Well, Paul's telling Christians here not to walk in the vanity of their own understanding. Well, how, how could that possibly be? The only way it could possibly be is God to teach me by his spirit. For I have, Paul writes, we have the mind of Christ that God may instruct us. So the only way is for us to be taught by the Spirit of God, for us not to walk in the vanity of our mind, to be taught of God. And in the vanity of their mind, he said these Gentiles were alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them. So they're alienated from God's life. Now, many Christians have no idea that they have God's life. They, they don't even know that Jesus come to give us the life of God, to put the life of God in us. I've come that you may have life. See, see the problem we have is we think Jesus said, I've come that you might just live forever. I'm just going to make it that you, like you are, would just be good and live forever. I'm getting rid of all your sins, but you, like you are, is going to live forever. That's the problem. That's the ignorance that's in us. He didn't say that. He said, I have come that you may have life. And this was not so life he was talking about. He was talking about life of God. And he says, I am the life. And as the good shepherd, he laid down his soul into death as an offering for our souls. He gave himself up as an offering for our souls to bring us into his life. See, his soul was not left in corruption. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. In, in Acts chapter 2, it says, You men of Israel, verse 22, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man to prove to God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. More, moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Sheol is the word in the Old Testament, the, the place of the dead. The, I guess, underworld of the dead, I believe is what this word means. But 
he would not leave his soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we are witnesses. How are we witnesses? Because this Jesus that God raised from the dead dwells in you. His spirit has come to live in you. Christ is in you. That's how you're, you're a witness of his resurrection because he has come to live in you, just like he said. My father and I will come and make our abode with you. So this Jesus God raised from the dead. He did not leave his soul in hell. He raised him from the dead and made him one with God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Quickened him from the dead. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And now this Jesus has come to live in you and I to raise us up from the dead, out of the realm of death out of the realm of Adam, <laughs> and he is our life. So our life is not our souls anymore. Does our souls have life? You could say, oh, yes, it does. But our life is not our souls. Our life is Christ within our souls. He is our life, glory to God. And we live by him. So we have eternal life dwelling in us because that's what he is. He is the eternal one. And we are dwelling in the eternal one. The good shepherd gave his life, his soul. He poured out himself to death. And took it again by his eternal spirit. But he didn't just take himself. He brought us with him. I believe it's Hebrews 2 that tells us that. That he was willing to bear the shame that he might bring many sons unto glory. And that's where we are. We're beholding his glory as he's revealed in us. Glory to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus, for being the bishop and shepherd of my soul. Because you brought it out of death. The death of Adam, the death of the old man. Into the life of God. Hallelujah. Well, I'll stop right here right now. And we will continue on next week. May the Lord just richly, richly bless your heart, your mind, your understanding. My heart, my mind and understanding in the knowledge of Christ. Glory to God. God bless you. Amen.